I'd entertain a motion at this time. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to move items one, two, and three on the consent agenda. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The consent agenda items are approved. And with that, we will move along to the housing element. So if we could have uh, a staff report on uh, the housing element, which has been continued from an earlier meeting, we appreciate that. Good evening, Planning Commissioners. Michelle Nielsen here to present the um, staff report on the county's um, housing element update, uh, 2019 housing element amendments. Um, as was pointed out by Director Ford, there are a number of uh, supplementals um, that have been, that have accompanied uh, the staff report or transmitted subsequently to that. Uh, for members of the public who are here, um, there's copies of the supplemental available at the table to the right of the podium because they may be of interest. Um, <clears throat> okay. So um, we've had a number of hearings um, on this one and, num uh, and uh, public outreach sessions. So. We're going to start out with uh, what are our next major milestones um, and then kind of a, a brief overview of what we've done, um, uh, what's, what's occurred, what's the process looked like. So um, the next um, big milestone um, following um, a recommendation by your planning commission um, on the housing element amendments is for um, it to advance to the Board of Supervisors for public hearings where again the Board of Supervisors will take uh, public testimony and consider um, consider that input um, the recommendation of your commission um, and um, any other further new input also they have to uh, consider the comments formal written comments um, they that are transmitted by HCD um, which we expect to get um, later this month we did have our initial consult with them um, July 1st, um, there's a summary of that in your staff report. Um, and then shortly thereafter um, is for the, um, at the, board of, the Board of Supervisors adopts it on August 27th. That is their last meeting um, in August. And the reason, um, and then followed by transmittal to housing and community development. And the reason for the short timeline is um, as we have previously mentioned, um, having a compliant housing element is critical for jurisdictions to remain eligible for funding and to not be further penalized um, for being out of compliance. Um, if, it, if, the, if it's significantly delayed, um, actually the, by statute, the length of time for um, the housing element cycle shortens from, in this case, Humboldt County, which shortened from eight years to a four-year cycle. Um, so it's very critical um, for us to keep this. It is a very rapid pace. There is a lot of materials to go over, um, and um, but we still need to keep pressing on and working through this. <clears throat> so what has occurred? Um, what's been undertaken by, by the county um, since we initiated this effort. Um, as outlined on the slide here, uh, the a summary of the public engagement effort and the, 
this, this staff report and previous staff reports have trans, uh, contained more detail on comments we received during the public workshops with summaries and whatnot, but um, we've had stakeholder meetings, um, we've had two series of uh, public workshops. Um, the first one began in uh, late February, and then the second workshop was, uh, um, workshop series was in April. Um, and so that's, that's summarized there. Um, as far as um, your, where your commission has been um, involved, uh, this is summarized here. We had our first, just a very brief departmental presentation, um, reviewing the schedule, and uh, then followed by a workshop, and then um, the last two hearings, um, one in May and one back in June. Um, so we, we kind of jumping ahead here, um, but it, it is, given the timeline, um, it, is, it is important that um, we press through it and um, that it's important to get a, and that we need a recommendation from your commission on this housing element. So the format for this evening is to systematically present the goals and the nine key topics of the housing element. And so we've gone through the housing element and broken it into these kind of nine broad topics where there are goals, policies, standards, and implementation measures that cover these nine topics. And so that's what we're going to be reviewing. And, and then, so we're gonna have a discussion, um, review, go through those very briefly. Um, we would like to, the, um, testimony, uh, the public hearing to be open for public testimony on, on the topics um, individually, um, so not waiting until the end, um, and then um, discussion by your commission and um, straw votes, consensus votes on the, first the goals and then the topics and then um, looking to obtain a recommendation on the housing element um, that we can advance to the Board of Supervisors. <coughs> So uh, these next two slides capture um, four housing element objectives that um, are a reflection of the public input we've heard at the workshop series, the input we've received from community organizations, from other agencies like Department of Health and Human Services, um, the um, members of the um, Humble Housing and Homeless Coalition, um, and also from your planning commission and also incorporates the statutory requirements. Um, as con and also we reviewed these um, at the last hearing, um, but it's the direction that the housing element is going is that the county is being a proactive partner for housing to address existing and future needs of everyone in the community. Responding to shelter and housing needs of people are experiencing homelessness or um, at risk of homelessness as these needs are not being met. Um, third, uh, responding to the need for entry-level housing by increasing the diversity of housing forms, because um, that was something we heard consistently um, throughout our workshops. Um, and then finally, meet all the statutory requirements. <clears throat> so I'm going to jump to the goals next, and then uh, um, that'll be, I think it's on three slides, and then we'll uh, pause at that point. And, um, and then um, um, have some discussion, ask or answer any questions, the, um, and if there's any um, public testimony. So, <clears throat> so these are the same goals. Uh, they are a little bit shorter, but they are the same goals that are contained in the staff report and have been presented to your commission um, through the series of public hearings. They're reordered slightly, but they are the same um, same content. Um, so the housing needs of special populations, that the housing element is assuring sufficient affordable housing opportunities of special populations, emergency shelters, supportive housing, and transitional housing. Um, this is for the needs of those who are um, experiencing homelessness or at risk of um, experiencing homelessness and to provide additional forms of um, shelter. Um, affirmatively furthering fair housing, promote um, fair housing, improve access to opportunity, um, prohibit discrimination. 
housing production, that's a big one we, we've heard and uh, what the data shows is um, address regula um, regulatory and procedural practices along with financial incentives that promote creation of affordable housing. Ultimately, the housing element has to provide housing inventory that is adequate for all income categories. Um, but as the last RENA uh, numbers show, um, the income categories for low and very low, um, actually above moderate, we were, we, the county underproduced um, housing. Um, housing diversity, and adequate supply of all forms of housing that's affordable to all income levels. So everyone in the community, there's an opportunity. Um, and then this is the third slide, then I'll pause. <clears throat> uh, workforce housing, I kind of reviewed that all, already. Then the residential land inventory, which is one of the most critical components of the housing element, is um, that the, there is land suitable um, for residential development over the eight-year planning cycle, um, and that there's adequate capacity to meet the projected needs. Yes, Director. Kind of identify what we'd like to do tonight after I turn my mic on. Is, is to kind of walk through these sections and give the commission an opportunity to hear the presentation from staff. This is out of um, attachment number three. It's on page 812. That's where the goals and policies are. So what we'd like to do at this point is have the commission ask questions about the goals and policies. We'd like to have the commission, after hearing from the public, make a decision on whether or not these are the correct set of goals and policies for the housing element tonight. And then we'd like to work with you and walk through the housing element and get to a place where we have kind of systematically walked through it, allowed you to deliberate on each of the different sections and, and then maybe take a consensus vote on each of the sections before finally getting to the end. I know I'm being redundant to what uh, Ms. Nelson said, but so at this point, we'd ask you to take a look at these goals and policies and uh, hear from the public and, and see if this adequately captures the needs that we should be trying to address within the housing element. Okay. Brian, you got a comment? Well, she was moving on to the land inventory. I had a question about that, but I'll wait until we actually get in okay. to that. I'd like to maybe have a brief discussion uh, uh, with directors and other commissioners because my concern is is that we've got we've got some goals to meet to move this along to the board of supervisors, and if we hear one item, stop, have a discussion, open up public comment, have a discussion, then a vote, we're going to open up public comment nine times tonight, uh, and there's no way we're going to get through this if we open up public comment nine times, uh, uh, and so. So my question for the commissioners, because uh, I don't want to be uh, autocratic about this, but but um, uh, I would prefer to go the route of staff making their presentation, open up public comment, have our discussion like we normally do, and and then we we'll then take our vote. And if we need to, amongst ourselves, uh, do some type of, uh, of in individual polling on the items as, as we're discussing them. We can discuss them in order. Uh, uh, I think that's going to be a little bit more efficient, a little bit more productive. So I'd like to hear from the commissioners if anyone has any anything to, to say that uh, in, in difference of that. Um, I think that sounds reasonable. I, I do have a question if I'm if I can ask. Okay. Well, then, well, before we get to it, let me just sum up. And uh, what we'll do then is, is you go ahead and, and walk through the, the items. We'll then we'll open up public discussion, and we'll come back, and then we can discuss amongst ourselves, one by one, as as you've gone through them. So, go ahead. Um, yeah, my question is more on this topic. Um, I just want to be clear as to what we're actually supposed to be looking at because I believe that's actually the most important question to just to narrow down the scope of what we're doing tonight. So um, we, we're just looking at whether we believe the goals and policies as outlined are adequate or desirable and not whether we feel they are um, feasible or attainable. 
Well, if you don't feel that they're feasible or attainable, obviously that's an important part of the discussion. But so I think the first question is, is are we being inclusive enough and aggressive enough to address the needs that exist in Humboldt County right now? Okay. Um, it's well, my, my problem with that is, is just that if, if I were to look at each and every one of these goals and policies in terms of feasibility, I would need to have a lot more information in terms of the finances and economics. Um, I mean, a lot of the references here are from nations like Canada or, or Finland where there are there's universal health care. I mean, there's social services covered by taxes. There's garbage pickup covered by taxes. You don't see garbage everywhere. Uh, we don't have that. And so, you know, I would say most of the references I would throw out, except for the ones maybe from D.C. and Utah, because I just don't see how we have the financial, we don't have the same social services network as a lot of the models that were relied on for these um, objectives. So for me, I, I mean, you know, just in terms of the goals and objectives themselves, that's one thing. But in terms of the feasibility, I, I just don't feel like I have enough information to, ter to determine, for example, I would like to see more garbage pickup. Maybe there'd be some dumpsters available, but I mean, how much does that cost? I, Who would, that's a private company here. Who's going to do that? So I, it's just that I have some concerns in terms of the information as to how these goals and objectives will be met rather than, you know, on top of perhaps looking at them uh, in terms of their value. Through the chair, if I could. One of the things that's really important to do with the housing element is to separate out the brick and mortar portion of it from the social service element of it. You know, a, a lot of t times things like dumpsters and trash pickup and things like that are not part of the brick and mortar discussion. You know, the real focus of the housing element is how do we incentivize and, con and encourage the construction of a housing. And one of the conclusions that this housing element reaches is that we cannot build affordable housing right now under the status quo. Changes have to be made. And so what this is trying to do is change the paradigm of the private government partnership in terms of how we construct housing in Humboldt County to meet the needs. Because you'll recall the table that we put up showing that we produced sufficient median income housing, but everything else was lagging well below our arena requirements. And so, I, I mean, I, I, I appreciate the fact that you have read everything so thoroughly to be able to cite that, but some of that is really beyond the scope of the housing element, and we could get bogged down in things that aren't related to what we're really trying to do, if, if I could say that with all due respect. Okay, thank you, that is, that is helpful. It's just, and yeah, it's just, I'm very familiar with a lot of the housing programs in, for example, Quebec. I uh, lived there for 21 years, and they're, they're highly successful, but they rely on a lot of social services that exist outside of that program. And so when I'm looking at this program that is modeled basically on that one, you know, there's a lot of extra costs that are going to go into it here, and I'm just it just makes it very difficult to deliberate on when we don't really have an idea of, say we do become uh, a county who's able to, for example, run housing. That would be great. I am in favor of that. Uh, it just, it just, there's a lot of unknowns is what I'm saying. Uh, I'm able to look at the goals and objectives and determine whether I think they're valuable or not, and to a degree attainable, but it's just that I, it's going to be very difficult to say for sure whether this is going to be something that's feasible for us or not. Uh, it, I, I, I suppose, you know, that that's just the, maybe the nature of the housing element. There are unknowns, and I, I perhaps should just accept that, but I did want to point out that a lot of the uh, research and the references that did go into this are based on models where the social services are coupled with um, the the larger social structure, which isn't in fact the case here. Uh, maybe if I could, Director, kind of summarize my, my 
take on this, and maybe you can or council can correct me if I'm in error. But I see our role and our responsibility in this is we are advising the board on policy and standards relative to this housing element. Once the board takes the action on that, then it's up to staff or some other department to uh, be the enforcement arm or the operational arm of trying to make sure that uh, the policies and standards that we set up are attained. Is that how this works? That, that is very true. And uh, one of the ways that that does work is that there is the housing um, office within planning and building where we work to achieve funding, uh, work to achieve grants. Having a certified housing element is, the, is step one uh, to that. We don't get that funding without this being certified and, in, and compliant. Uh, so it allows us to do that. But it also gives direction to the bigger uh, uh, county enterprise, which is something that uh, Commissioner McElroy was was speaking to, where there is a partnership with DHHS that also is looking to provide social services and fund the programmatic element of the housing needs. And, and that's not necessarily reflected completely here. You're right, that's, that's an unknown. But in direct response to Chair Morris, yes, it is then given to staff to go and implement this, and then we're held accountable for how well we do in our ability to get state funding, in our ability to maintain our certification. And, and so it is very, very important that we do chart a good vector, that we choose a good direction. That is really what is in front of the commission tonight. Here's where we wanna go. Um, is, is this choosing the appropriate direction with enough uh, incentive in it? And, and if it is, um, we would um, recommend to the commission that you would make a recommendation to the board to, to adopt that. Um, if, it, if it's not going far enough or if it's uh, maybe it's too aggressive, uh, then we would ask you to give that recommendation. But uh, it, it is charting some new ground here to try to implement some new things. Any other questions for director before we move along? If not, uh, Michelle, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so this next slide is just uh, text straight out of the uh, general plan, uh, just to give a little more context because we are um, goals, policies, and standards and implementation measures. What do those mean? Uh, goal is a general expression of community values, setting direction towards an ideal future. Policy is a, a specific statement that must be followed when making decisions. Standard is a specific, un, often quantified rule or measure that helps to find how a policy will be enacted and an implementation measure is an action, a procedure, a program, a technique used to be used to carry out the out the policy. Um, a lot of the implementation measures in this housing element um, will be uh, subsequent um, legislative actions, um, starting with um, to do zoning amendments to um, operationalize the, the, pol the goals, the policies, and the um, standards. So there's a lot of those in this element. There's a, um, it's a good thing we have eight years because we have a lot of work. <laughs> so I, since we've reviewed these and um, I'm not, I think there's a number of people here, I'm gonna keep this very brief and not get too wordy. Um, to allow uh, time for discussion um, for your commission and the public as well. So um, going back to, linking back to the objectives we just reviewed and the goals. Um, so the first topic area is housing needs for special populations. Uh, special populations by statute are elderly persons with disabilities, including developmental disabilities, <clears throat> large families, farm workers, families with female heads of households, people experiencing homelessness. These are folks that are often underrepresented or not represented at 
um, the, in these forums. Uh, so the, uh, this topic is to promote courage, um, a range of housing um, for, for these populations, uh, more specifically other Im implementation of a um, completed elder housing needs assessment that was done as part of this existing housing element and then um, evaluate farm worker housing needs, including cannabis workers, because they are not represented or underrepresented in the available data. So to capture what those farm worker housing needs are and um, to do an analysis and uh, develop a program that is uh, outlined by HCD for farm worker housing. And another component of farm worker housing is to update our local regulations to align with the state regulations. They, they don't match at this point in time. So number two, um, emergency shelters. Um, allowances for other forms of emergency shelters, including self, uh, safe parking. Uh, allowances in, uh, for shelters in specific zoning districts um, consistent with state law and encourage um, shelter development of, by groups, um, commu other community organizations um, led, you know, the DHHS would be the lead um, as this is, as shelters are largely, uh, have very strong social service component to them, um, but the, our job uh, the, and land use is to remove the land use regulations, and that's what state law dictates us to do. It, it doesn't um, provide for uh, discretion, a lot of discretion for shelters um, because um, there's a huge need it's, and it's not being met. Um, this, those statutes were passed back in about 2007. Brian. <laughs> So some of this is new, right? The, the changes for the emergency shelters and the safe parking is somewhat new, or there's some changes in this housing element, correct? Correct. So can we talk about the impact on the environmental impact report? I know we're using an old EIR and updating it. How do we make sure that any public health and safety and other types of things that would rise to the level of significant impacts under the EIR have been mitigated um, and addressed as part of this update? So where, um, where these other forms of emergency shelters, uh, like safe parking, um, another form that is now actually, def um, I think they passed the legislation navigation centers, those are another uh, type of emergency shelter. Um, it is actually the same, um, so the second bullet is the same zoning districts that now um, we say, the regs say they have to be specifically mapped. It's uh, the higher level commercial zoning districts, it's the um, where you're, and a higher level, res more intense residential development. So where you're gonna see um, more levels of improvement. And um, so there would still be, there's already still requirements written into the general plan like for protection of uh, water quality that even mis ministerial building permits um, are, they have to adhere to those standards. That just prompted a question that I had for you, Michelle, because you said higher residential standards for the parking and emergency shelters what do you mean by that exactly if I said that way I didn't mean it that way I meant a uh, higher more intense residential zoning districts R3 uh, residential multifamily not okay. stamp development standards I, I guess what I was getting at more so is if we're going to take away any discretionary forms of public procedures where specifics to that site could be brought up and maybe mitigated, such as traffic or other health and safety concerns? Are we making sure that the implementation measures and standards already address those ahead of time, since there won't be any ability for the community to give us input on what specific impacts that might have? With the chair, Michael Richardson, um, I'm the supervising planner in long range planning and what, what the um, programs are, are to develop regulations that will allow for these new safe parking areas and then also 
um, allow emergency shelters by right, according to the zone districts, outside of the areas that are currently mapped for emergency shelters. And before that action can be taken, before those new regulations can be put in place, we will be doing uh, further environmental analysis of the impacts associated with with those um, those new regulations and trying to predict what the uh, what the risk is and and what the appropriate mitigation measures are and then those mitigations would be folded into the um, the regulations them themselves. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay. Um, and then um, encouragement of financial shelters through financial and procedural incentives, financial that equates to um, uh, going after funding, um, procedural t uh, equates to um, streamlining, um, providing streamlining um, internal review of those, those applications as they come across the desk for actual projects. <clears throat> Um, as far as supportive and transitional housing, these are forms of housing that um, are targeted for um, as uh, more permanent forms of housing for um, uh, individuals who are experiencing homelessness or at risk. Um, there is some significant statutory mandates um, regarding the allowance for these. Um, and so the first bullet represents um, that an update to the local regulations to align with state law. Um, and the second one is similar to the, what you heard before, was um, providing uh, financial and procedural incentives um, for um, supportive and transitional housing, as these are um, key uh, forms of housing for the county to um, implement its adopted housing first um, um, approach for um, uh, addressing homelessness in our community. And then um, also related to this is um, support repeal of Article 34 of the California Constitution, which um, really hamstrings local jurisdictions' ability to provide um, a low, in, um, low income rental housing, which would be um, especially supportive housing. <clears throat> Uh, so our fourth topic area is um, policies and programs um, that support fair housing and affirm affirmatively furthering fair housing, um, and along with that is a reasonable is reasonable accommodation, and then um, policies and measures um, to implement those, including tenant displacement costs. Um, the affirmatively furthering fair housing is a new element of state law. Even though it's not a mandatory, not mandatory for jurisdictions to incorporate into their housing elements into 2021, um, uh, if you are a jurisdiction that goes after home partnership funds and uh, community development block grants, these which are both funding sources, it's a requirement that those jurisdictions have a program and that they are implementing um, a fair. A, Firmly furthering fair housing, which is basically looking to provide um, further access to higher opportunities and address discrimination. And the first step of that is to do an assessment, you know, have an understanding of what your jurisdiction situation is, um, which, so that would be a later implementation component to operationalize those, that measure. Um, so this, this group has uh, two slides. Um, so number five is um, increasing housing production through new construction, uh, facilitating, encouraging um, development of the residential land inventory, especially the affordable land inventory through um, incentives, um, <clears throat> promoting residential development and housing opportunity zones. Housing opportunity zones are those areas that have uh, full services uh, community water and sewer, um, usually higher uh, levels of um, transportation corridors as well. McKinleyville, uh, Eureka, the, the greater Eureka area, Redway, Garberville, um, those are all um, housing opportunity zones. Um, enhanced technical assistance um, 
in order for the, our community members to be able to take advantage of these incentives, uh, provide enhanced technical assistance through pre-approved plans, increased accessibility to staff, and improvements on uh, to the online information. Um, and <clears throat> Another element of this to improve housing production through new construction is to support our um, and partner with our community services districts um, to support their efforts to expand and improve their capacity uh, for water and sewer. Uh, maybe they have constraints related to just the condition of their existing infrastructure um, and it, it's pr um, creating a constraint. Um, Again, we have uh, the repeal of Article 34. It's the same issue um, as I just talked about. And then the last bullet here is use of county-owned property for financing um, or construction in support of the state's current efforts as part of an executive order from January 2019 to develop affordable housing on state excess-owned property. Question for you, Michelle. Can... Uh, the use of surplus county property, can that be done without the repeal of th Article 34? I don't believe so. Not, no. Council? Article 34 of the California Constitution was passed by initiative in 1950. It requires voter approval for state or local government to pr provide, to develop, finance, construct, or operate low-income housing. S so uh, essentially, it requires a project to be submitted to the voters and approved before it could be developed with uh, local government funds on local government property, um, <coughs> on state-owned property, uh, it, it's a significant constraint to, to actually providing affordable housing. And the reason I brought, that, brought this up, because this is the second time I've seen where we've, we've got something kind of contingent upon the repeal of, 30, of Article 34, and, and my concern is that we don't have some policies or some standards set up here that uh, are not... Yeah that are not going to be relevant if 34 isn't repealed? Well, if Article 34 is not repealed, it simply means in order to pursue those projects, they have to be submitted to the voters in Humboldt County and approved. So it's not, a, it's not an absolute prohibition, but it creates a high bar for the actual production of housing. Is it a, a simple majority of, of uh, local voters? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead, Michelle. Um, for um, anyone who may be interested, there is a currently uh, pending legislation to add a um, item to the ballot, um, a legislative initiative, state constitution amendment, or Senate constitutional amendment um, one, uh, that it look that's seeking to uh, repeal Article Thirty Four. Uh, so we're more than halfway through. All right. So number six, um, housing production through retention and rehabilitation of the of our existing housing uh, housing stock. So co uh, conservation of that uh, stock, um, what we have. Um, so um, he, uh, create regulatory incentives for retention of historic and legal non-conforming housing units um, for you know purposes of subdivision um, and other settings, multifamily. <clears throat> um, we do have a pr provision similar to this already in our housing element, but this is looking at um, expanding and making it available to um, it added uh, historic housing units and um, additional settings like planned unit development and multifamily. Uh, the second bullet is tracking assisted housing units that are at risk um, at conversion. So um, ones that are deed restricted for 20, say 50 years, and their, their term is coming up um, to track those. And then um, before the restriction um, sunsets, reach out to that property owner and see if they have an interest um, in retaining them as affordable and um, if that there's and working with them, if uh, funding is needed to, to do that. So that's what that bullet represents. And then 
this uh, third is continuation of the safe home pro program should um, just that sunsets in 2022. Um, and before it expires, um, just give an opportunity for um, before that happens uh, to, if it's successful, if there's a, a community desire for it to continue to provide that opportunity before it sunsets. <clears throat> and second slide on this topic <clears throat> would be um, local code, code amendments for habitability and maintenance of housing um, so that establish some thresholds. This would be something ultimately should it, um, get through the process would be um, implemented as part of uh, by our code enforcement folks and um, so that housing doesn't deteriorate so badly and so then it could be um, uh, rehabilitated maybe before it gets to it being um, either needing to be demoed or it be more costly to um, to repair and then um, conduct housing surveys um, housing condition surveys um, that does kind of go to funding and also help prioritize where um, funding for rehabilitation um, should be targeted, which communities um, or neighborhoods. So this is uh, this topic has three slides: uh, housing diversity, flexible allowances for accessory dwelling units. I think we've talked about these quite a bit. Um, and this is also operationalized um, through pre-approved plans, financial assistance, um, a financial assistance pilot program, allowances for the tiny houses, movable tiny houses and tiny house villages. Um, allows for conversion of hotels and motels and other discontinued group facilities like hospitals, discontinued used schools um, for uh, single room occupancy units, SROs. Um, continue to incur and support the continuation continuation of existing um, manufactured home and special occupancy parks and for those who op those owners who want to expand to work with them if, um, if they're interested um, to uh, facilitate their expansion um, that those are both discretionary permits so there would definitely be opportunity for um, public participation and input on those um, and then uh, zoning amendments for a mixed housing zoning district and alternative lodge park. Um, support the alternative owner builder program. Um, encourage new and experimental construction techniques, um, conservation of natural resources, biological resources, and support for alternative utility systems. These are um, sort of carryovers from the previous housing element, but we don't, don't want to dissuade. Um, these are more typically embraced by our rural um, property owners. We don't want to dis keep them, um, have opportunities for them to do things that are a little bit different. And then um, going back to our technical assistance program, um, increase um, public awareness that the, we have these incentives. Um, There's not just a plan that six, sits on the shelf that nobody knows about by um, improving um, access to staff, um, also having pre-approved plans for uh, different housing types and so on. Um, number eight, our residential land inventory. Um, very critical component of the housing element and um, it's important for the county to maintain an inventory that is adequate to meet its share of the regional housing needs plan, um, the RENA, um, the same as regional housing needs plan. Uh, ma monitoring and reporting the affordable, affordable housing development on properties um, in the inventory. Um, implementation of the Martin Slough Interceptor Project. Um, I imagine there, there's some supplemental about that and we can, we can talk about that some more. Um, had some good progress on that. Um, standards for calculating density and development potential um, are written into that to um, keep those, un those uh, especially in the affordable uh, inventory available. These next two are direct input that we received as part of our housing and community development. Um, Compliance review was to amend our zoning regulations to add a replacement requirement um, and provide for buy right development um, for housing developments that um, include 20% or more um, units that are affordable to um, in low income or lower um, 
even though our, we try to make a case that our um, regulations don't discriminate or provide any specifics, but they, the input we received was to, we need to actually have this specifically called out. And then um, conformance with the Housing Accountability Act um, that um, requests to go below the residential density um, in the, res the affordable land inventory, there has to be, there's some very specific findings that have to be made um, as part of the Housing Accountability Act. This would be done as part at the individual project level. It's got incorporated in the zoning regulations, it's more or less carrying it forward. Finally, our last group, only two slides. Um, so this is kind of a catch-all um, that didn't fit too neatly into those previous ones, but they all go to um, improve housing production and affordability, although not more indirectly than directly. So going forward, regulations for residential development will be objective. Um, initiate zoning amendments for off-street parking reductions for residential uses. Um, there's specific interest in that of our last hearing. So that would be a, um, a legislative process, um, public outreach hearings and so forth. Um, these next three are actually carryovers from the current housing element, um, but it to they get it, developmental constraints. The first two, um, accessibility to fault evaluation reports, um, guidelines for uh, housing development, tsunami areas, and then support of the city of Arcadia's effort to annex this parcel. Michelle, so that could you go back to that first slide? I might have to. Right before this one not way back. So what do you mean exactly by the set, or first bullet point there will be objective? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, there's a specific um, standard written in here and I can, um, let me look that up and then I can report back on what, give you the number, the reference okay. that defines what objective is. Okay. Does that, com does that complete your re staff? Thanks for asking. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay, we, we've had some, you know, quite a bit of clarification and questions uh, mm -hmm. as she gave her report. Uh, without getting into a discussion stage, before we open it up to uh, general comments, anyone else have any, any questions for clarification? Go ahead and do it this time. Just a couple of recommendations. You've done <clears throat> an excellent job, I believe, in writing the plan and doing your research. There's a, a few areas that I'd like to recommend. One is that we include in their evaluation and promoting um, safe housing for our existing housing. Uh, a lot of it was built many years ago and it doesn't meet earthquake standards and um, I think that we should take a look at that. Um, if we're gonna reduce building costs, which I believe permitting costs and encouraging low-income housing, there needs to be restrictions on that housing to ensure that it stays affordable because I've heard comments here that we need to, you know, in, reduce density size of parcels, but there's no guarantee that the housing that's gonna be built is gonna be affordable. And when you build affordable housing, often there's five, 10 year restrictions on maintaining some sort of affordable rent. And so I, I think that that needs to go forward. I think also it's really important to emphasize again that there are eight federally recognized Indian tribes in Humboldt County and that they have to be included in a plan in order to go after state funding, and so I'd like to see them at least named, and I wrote them all out for you, and I can pass that off to you, but e even if it's just saying that they're included in this plan and that we support their efforts to um, provide low-income housing, because not all tribal people live on reservations. Uh, your plan indicates that they're under federal jurisdiction, but they also live off the reservation. They represent the second largest um, racial group in the county and the second largest number of homeless um, residents in the county. So I think it, it at least warrants naming the eight re federally recognized tribes and saying that you will, the county will work with those tribes in their efforts. And that could be as simple as writing a letter of support when they go after funding, but every grant says you have to be in a housing plan. So if they're not in this plan, then that hampers their efforts to get funding. So I, I'd like to make sure that happens. Um, and other than that, I think you've done a pretty good job. Well, with that, 
I think we will open this up for public comment. Anyone wishing to comment uh, on uh, this uh, housing element uh, item before us, uh, please approach the podium at this time. And uh, we do have a full house. I will uh, uh, request that you uh, confine your comments to three minutes. I don't know how many folks are going to speak here, but if, uh, if the majority of you wish to speak there, it's uh, going to be a long night. So go ahead, sir. Probably not too many people. My name is Bill Rodstrom. I work at the Jefferson Community Center. And I just wanted to uh, thank the staff for doing a very thorough job on the housing element. Um, and, and my main issues are the, uh, what it would look like when you get to the details on the zoning. Because um, uh, right now there's a lot of um, R1 zoning in the co county jurisdictions um, that could be moved more dense, like to R3 or so, especially along bus routes. And, and I'm thinking places like uh, east of Harrison and where we need more workforce housing. South of Harris, and then Cutton, Rose, uh, Rosewood, uh, Pine Hill, there's routes, the red route, the green route, the uh, gold route. They all kind of go through the areas with a lot of single family home uh, zoning. So if those could be more dense and allow for duplexes and triplexes and fourplexes, we could get more of this implemented. So I'm, I'm definitely for that. And if there's a, a bigger parcel, like a 10,000 square foot parcel or a couple of 5,000s next door, per, uh, perhaps allowing those to be cottages with maybe six 1,000 square foot homes in, a, in an area where there's maybe a public uh, joint m meeting kitchen or some area like that too. I'd like to see the flexi flexibility come out into the zoning because without all these, these great goals, without the zoning to go with them, the land inventory isn't really there. And so I'm looking for, um, for that, for the zoning uh, amendments that are going to be needed. Um, and other than that, and this, would, this would include uh, Central Avenue and McKinleyville, School Road, uh, Garberville. A lot, of, a lot of areas could be improved with higher density um, in the zoning. So I know this housing element is not a zoning hearing, but uh, I think that uh, you need to have both for it truly really to work. And I, I think the city of... Eureka kind of went the other way, did their zoning uh, ordinances and changes first and uh, then their housing element. I think that uh, the state now is, uh, now that uh, AB 101 passed, is going to be put more pressure on jurisdictions for raising, uh, to address their arena needs. Um, and I think we could meet uh, not only the low income needs, but uh, a lot of workforce housing by increasing density and uh, with flexibility in what we allow in the zoning. Um, that's my main point. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Hi, my name is Jenna Bader, and I would like to speak on behalf of our community members that are currently living outside with no access to any legal shelter that is safe, warm, and dry. Um, I just wanted to speak my mind about that and hope that these populations are represented in your plan. I understand that affordable housing is an option that needs to happen for more permanent structures, but until we get there, we definitely need to have something in place. Um, I would like to see safe parking options and tiny house village options um, and sanctioned camping. Those would be really helpful in helping people just survive every day until we get these um, in place. And I would also like to speak on behalf of future generations for climate change. I know that there's um, a lot going on in the world and things can tend to happen really rapidly if we're not planning for it. And I would like to just mention that any of these plans that you have for constructing things that are going to be permanent long term um, to consider sea level rise with that. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Hi, my name is Peg Anderson uh, from Southern Humboldt. Um, I am part of a group called Soham Housing Opportunities. And we're a group of volunteers that um, have been doing many, many things. We're just volunteers uh, helping in any way we can, emergency shelter, feeding people, supplying people with, with uh, um, 
things that they need. But our focus is to, we have no housing in Southern Humboldt right now, and our population is growing. I think because of the point in time count we had, I think we have 10% of our population is homeless, I would guess. And I would say that this is a humanitarian crisis. I think as far as feasibility, you mentioned feasibility, I think we're at a low point now where the worst has happened for, for, for our homeless population. And that this plan that is proposed here is so, uh, shedding such a ray of light and, and hope for our population and for us as volunteers that we could actually improve our economy. I mean, our economy in Southern Humboldt, as you probably know, is like so in such a just free fall. We're, we're all feeling it very badly and our homeless population is growing and we have to have a starting point of some type. So people who are living outside now, they need services, they need facilities, they need a safe place to be because there's a lot of violence against homeless. And so if this plan, many of the, uh, the items in this plan are so enlightened and have been used in other communities with great success and I, I really support it and, I can, and I'm very happy to hear about it. So thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. My name is Yashi Hoffman. I also am involved at the Sohom Housing Opportunity Project. And we've been working for years looking at either through emergency shelters that we've sponsored, we've put plans together to do a detached bedroom community with budgets. We've shown them to supervisors. We've shown them to many, many people without much response. Uh, I also served for a time on the homeless task force. And at that initial beginning of that task force, there was uh, some opportunity to pick up the Lucas Street property to provide seed money for uh, projects here. and. That has not happened, and the information tonight from County Council about Prop 34 really puts a monkey wrench into if the, any of those properties, Lucas or otherwise, were to become available. That money would not fly right now until 34 gets taken care of, so we're even further out. And with that, that one ray of hope to get some funding from the county, we now have nothing. I know that this board does not control the purse, purse strings of the county. We go to the supervisors for that. But I really would implore you to let them know about the pain and suffering that goes on, at least in my community, in Southern Humboldt. And there has to be a, another answer beside the county doesn't have any money. I know times are tight for everybody. The county has money, it's already allocated. I'm asking you to let them know that we would like some kind of relief, some kind of help. This is not gonna get solved by the faith-based community or the private sector. This is not gonna be solved by a group of people like us that are all over 60 years old that are trying to make something happen. We have a 501c3, we will umbrella with anybody that has a good plan and will work to make it happen. That has been unsuccessful to date. But the county has got to make a change, a very big change in its allocation of money to solve this problem. These things that have been proposed on this project with safe parking, with uh, detached bedroom communities, they are much more affordable. They, we don't have, as everyone knows, we don't have housing in the pipeline. We don't have anything that's gonna happen soon. But these are stop gaps. These will help some people. And if we can show that it can be done, if we can do it with success, knock down some nimbyism, show a successful project, it can happen. I know I'm talking too long, but this is important. And Whatever you can bring to bear with the Board of Soups to let them know how acute this is and what the people are looking for, we need it. And thank you, and thank you to the Planning Commission, Michael, Michelle, for adding this into the housing element. Question for you, Speaker. Yes. Um, one of the items that Michelle went through was the um, AOB 
uh, type of uh, uh, relaxation. Uh, and there was some language in there about uh, unique construction techniques or something along that line. I don't have it in front of me there, but uh, because uh, there has been the last 15 years that I've been around or longer, there has been a tremendous concern about um, a lot of these uh, unpermitted or illegal rural housing uh, things. And a lot of that uh, unpermitted or illegal has to do with septic because that is one of the bigger costs of bringing some of this stuff into to being legal. Uh, and the question for you is uh, if this, one of our, our policies or standards allow the, uh, the opportunity for these unique construction, would composting toilets, in your opinion, be an assistance in putting on uh, secondary dwelling units on some of these areas where it's possible to attend and have that as, as uh, secondary housing. Absolutely, absolutely. Composting toilets would solve a lot of problems. It's easier to get water and power down. Sewer is always the big bugaboo. Now, we would also need to come up with a way to deal with gray water disposal that would deal with showers and what types of of soaps would be used and how we would deal with it. Because so the ideal situation to be able to find a site that would uh, have provision for that. It gets onerous to start, to start tanking your gray water out and disposing of it in expensive. So we're looking for land that would obviate those kinds of problems. But composting toilets would certainly help. Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Janelle Ager, and um, I, I apologize for sending you such a long uh, letter <laughs> late in the game. Um, but I did, I did so because I wanted to honor the work that the, the board had done in passing the resolutions and make sure that that was included, that, that it would strengthen the, the housing element. Um, I wasn't trying to um, say that people had not done their job. <coughs> I just, there was information that they would have no reason to know. Um, um, so that was the reason for what I went in. And then the shelter crisis declaration particularly it provides the county, um, they've passed it, and it provides protection, uh, liability protection and the ability to set aside health and safety things while maintaining basic health and safety. It sets aside some of the regulations. Um, so I think it's really important that it be a um, included. I also would like to talk a, a moment. I'm, a, I'm an advocate for Housing First, so I want to touch briefly on that. Um, it's, people focus on the housing, um, but the housing is just a tool. It's a place for people to live, to be stable, to be able to take care of themselves to a certain degree that they cannot do on the streets. And so um, it's a place to live basically, is what Housing First is about. Um, certainly, all of us would like them to have a house, brick and mortar house, but in the meantime, again, the shelter crisis declaration, sanctioned camps, tiny house villages, those are all alternatives um, that can provide that stability and that sense of, of, of self and being able to take care of oneself a little bit more. Um, I also wanted to talk about, you brought up Finland, and um, I happen to know that uh, there was a study that looked at Finland and at Ireland. And Finland adopted Housing First and invested in developing affordable housing. And their homeless count went from 3,100 to zero. Um, Ireland instead built more shelters and uh, took the shelter approach. And their homeless count went from 1,200 to 5,100. And so, uh, again, a camp, uh, tiny house villages, those are a, a place to live. A shelter is just a place to stay for the night. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Hello, my name is Kathy Miller, and I'm with the um, SOHUM Housing Opportunities Board as well. 
Um, I also come representing Eel River Cleanup Project and the Southern Humboldt uh, Community Healthcare District Foundation Board. Um, in January of this year, um, those three organizations collaborated to do the point in time count in Southern Humboldt. And we were able to count 230 homeless in Southern Humboldt. That is the lowest point in time in year, in time of year for homeless in our community because it's really cold and um, some people have gone home even, but um, so ever since then, it just keeps building um, until December of this year um, with the termigant uh, community people coming in to trim marijuana. So we have a huge problem in Southern Humboldt. It's, um, it's just, over, they're kind of overrunning our community. <laughs> And everybody really wants to see people in housing, you know. They, a lot of the problems are caused just because they don't have a place to stay. They don't have a place to be clean and to uh, just live. So um, I don't know if I'm making any sense. But um, also my, my husband is, the, is Mike Miller who does the Eel River Cleanup Project. He started out seven and a half years ago um, going out twice a week and picking up um, uh, garbage. He goes to the homeless camps and he um, passes out trash bags to them and asks them to fill up the bags and leave them at their, um, at their trailheads and then he'll come and pick it up the following um, time he comes in. And in that time, he's um, picked up 75,000 uh, pounds of trash per year. And um, that's, you know, um, more than half a million are, and pounds of trash. And so this is all, you know, homeless trash. This is trash that would be in our river, in our woods, in all over our towns, you know. So it's not just, you know, the housing. It's, it affects everybody. It affects our businesses. It affects our environment, our river. And we just, we really need to take care of it. Um, I wanted to thank you also for the, the great um, housing element. Uh, plan and um, I guess that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Hello, uh, my name is Cassandra Castrita, and uh, I just wanted to make a public comment and say that we cannot wait for permanent housing and that these affordable alternatives in the housing element with county support through grants, land leases, needed zoning ordinance uh, modifications can rapidly make these a reality for our neighbors now without a safe place to be. And these people um, range from men, women, children, families, and college students who all would greatly benefit from these alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Hi, Nezzy Wade, and um, I resonate with a lot of the comments that have been made about alternatives, most especially what um, Director Ford uh, mentioned in having to um, shift the paradigm. And I don't think a lot of the things that we even are including on the housing element are enough to shift the paradigm. And uh, a lot of the commentary, I, I know we have to do uh, and say in the housing element what will meet housing, you know, HCD requirements and all of that. Um, but housing for all and, and a variety of categories really is that housing continuum that I've talked to you about before. And so I, I want, like I've heard other speakers say, somehow in our housing element, the statement that declares the urgency that we have. I know we can't, we can't create housing, and we aren't gonna have 
um, even through, um, you know, we, we, we won't have affordable housing, so we have to shift that paradigm. And there's no one size that fits all. And we, I'm, I'm with Affordable Homeless Housing Alternatives, I'm on the board for RCAA. I'm on the Housing Trust Fund and Homeless Solutions Committee. I'm engaged in lots and lots and lots of different intersecting avenues. And I'm very aware that um, most organizations like AHA and Southern Humboldt folks are relying on land options for alternatives. The question about composting toilets, I attended all the workshops from environmental health. I've been to their meetings about composting toilets. I've suggested let's think about that not as single family residential things, but in terms of clusters of small communities so that we can use composting toilets that would accommodate people in more outlying areas because every community in Humboldt County needs these kinds of options. Um, and if we're gonna rely on DHHS to provide the social services, I know cities don't have them. They, Eureka's created a Cape Foundation and they've been able to do some things related to what they want to do for homelessness in their communities. But I can tell you as a member of the Housing and Homeless Coalition and, and um, essentially we in these options, these things that are outside the box, the paradigm that we need to shift are not going to be accepted, acceptable uses by a lot of that because we are not going to be housing quality standards enough to get funding through the continuum of care and these kinds of things. So it's really important that um, we support the repeal of 34 and that we also um, evaluate whatever we can to um, get some of these options and honor the shelter crisis that we really have because we can do a lot of things to help people thrive and survive in the interim and we have many, many of them. We're on the streets with them all the time, so that's from their point of view as well. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. My name is Linda Lee, and I live in Manila, and uh, I was so excited to read the Civil Grand Jury's report on housing issues uh, late recently, and I hope every government official really takes heed of their recommendations and their mandates, actually. Uh, I really liked the title that said, Like Home, There Is No Place, which is true for so many of our citizens. I don't know how many of you ever, have ever heard of this book, Tent City Urbanism, From Self-Organized Camps to Tiny House Villages. It's a manual for how to set these things up that has been successfully implemented in many cities around the country. I'm just gonna read you a paragraph of his introduction. Sprawling shanty towns may be a reality of third world countries, but certainly not in the United States, right? To uphold this notion, we have adopted legal frameworks that make these informal settlements unlawful through various zoning, trespassing, and anti-camping regulations. Instead, one must purchase the right to land on which shelter is constructed. And even then, one must hire professionals to design and build the house and apply for permits to certify that the shelter adheres to standardized building code. A glaring problem with this approach is that not all citizens can or ever will meet the formal expectations of renting or owning a home. While laws, property rights, and the specialization of home building give order to our society, they also ensure perpetual disorder and unrest through the creation of homelessness. This conflict has been exacerbated in recent years as greater demands are being placed on cities without the budgets to match. So I think what many people are telling you in this group is that there are very low impact, uh, low, uh, good environmental, environmentally sound solutions to our homeless problem. We just have to open our minds to embrace these sort of these sort of things. And uh, this has been a Bible for many of us who, have follow, who are in, uh, in this movement, and I would be happy to supply a, couple, uh, a, a copy to anyone in this group who would like it. I will send you a group email with my email address, and uh, if anyone would like a copy of this book, I'll be happy to give you one. Thanks a lot. You've been doing good work lately. Thank you, Speaker. Next speaker, please. Can I do it again? What? what? You, you've spoken already? Can I speak again? 
I'll give you one minute and th that will be it. Um, I just know that our part of the county and Eureka and Northern Humboldt is really trying to cultivate tourism and cultivate a good image for our county and to improve our, beautify our county, make it attractive. I, I just know that I travel outside of Humboldt County and that when we are famous for our homelessness here. And I think the first step to creating a viable economy and, and a place where peop that people want to visit is to house everyone and to get people out of this out of this dilemma thank you okay thank you speaker anyone else wishing to comment anyone um, first of all I, I do want to commend the, the planning department extraordinary job but when i went and looked at the housing element i thought to myself what is there in it that really is going to make a difference it's going to put shelter over somebody who's suffering and what I found is that there have been some um, shelter crisis declarations in other cities and communities. And I thought to myself, what is the difference between theirs and ours? And I'm going to be honest with you. The difference is that they, when they decided to declare these shelter crises, they did it with a sense of urgency. And they did it with a sense of leadership, that they were going to speak to their community and galvanize everybody they could to come together and use what resources they had to create partnerships that we could do the best we can. And the, you know, the housing, the HCD says that when people are without shelter, they need immediate, uh, immediately addressed. Um, and the thing is that, you know, I realize if I start screeching, nobody will listen to me. So I will say very quietly, that this is a list of 26 people who have died and been documented by the coroner from July 1st until April 28th of this year. If that many people had died in a massacre, it would be front page news across the country. So I think there's no doubt that we're in the middle of a crisis. And I think there's no doubt that we need urgency. But what will bring that about? And it occurs to me that you are the ones we need. We really need you. You were appointed because you have leadership capacity and abilities, and there's become a kind of compassion fatigue. There are no easy answers. I mean, when you look at every single community, whether it's San Jose or Berkeley, they all utilize what's unique to them. San Jose has a beautiful, beautiful rotating church facility that's been going on for years because the people there are happy to be able to practice the gospel and show it to their children. This is what it looks like, but it's also interfaith. Then you go to Berkeley, and we know Berkeley, you know they're considered kind of progressive. Well, they came up with solutions to the obstacle that we identify, which is pets, possessions, and partners, and they've created a center that utilizes that. So what it seems to me is we've had a breakdown of communication, and because of health reasons, I've only just been able to go out and start to talk to people outside. And the missing link in this whole process are the people out there, because the things they tell me are so beautiful and so encouraging and so, you know, would lead to solutions, because what they tell me, one, a man I met the other on the weekend said, he, and he, was that he wanted it to be based on love and that people should learn to use their gifts within these programs and that we can, but also limits. And so what I'm asking then in the limited time is that before this meeting is over, that you work with us out here so that this doesn't become one of those great documents that are on the shelf in Humboldt County life. During the 90s, there were a million of them. We could have a bonfire with them. But I think there's potential here to turn this into a breathing, powerful resource for actualizing the different, and there's no solution. We need to try different things and find out what works as a laboratory. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Anyone else wishing to comment? Anyone? Seeing no one, we'll close this section of the public comment and uh, it'll come back to the commission for discussion. But prior to that, I think we will take a 10 minute recess and when it comes back, uh, the commission will discuss uh, this uh, housing element item and we'll uh, hopefully take an action tonight. 10 minutes. Folks, let's take our seat, please. Take our seat, please. Okay, we will resume the uh, July 11th meeting of the Planning Commission.
and uh, we are we have brought it back to the commissioners for discussion on the housing element. And with that, I'll open it up for the commissioners. Brian, just a question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, my recollections, we had a, a, a couple of to-do list items for staff to report back to us on, and um, if if that rings any bells for staff, if they could walk through how they incorporated those changes or or brought back those concepts, I'd appreciate it. Um, through the chair, um, Commissioner Newman asked specifically um, in response to a slide about what was an objective standard. Um, took me a while to track it down, but I did locate it. It is um, policy number 29, which is on page 815, and I'll just read it real quickly. Um, an objective standard shall mean zoning, subdivision, or design review standards that involve no personal or subjective judgment by a public official and are uniformly verifiable by reference to an external and uniform bench benchmark or criterion available and knowable by both the development applicant or proponent and the public official prior to submittal. So as an example, that would be a, a setback standard from the property line. The setback is 20 feet from the property line to the, the structure. Um, that's an objective standard. Uh, a non-objective standard would be it's compatible with the neighborhood. Hopefully that provides clarification. Yes, thank you. Weren't, weren't there three that we, we had requested? Three items? Yeah, and I can speak to um, perhaps the main one, which is the uh, Martin Slough Interceptor Project. You requested clarification on what the status of that project the implementation of, pro of that project was. And uh, we met with HCSD, the Humboldt Community Services District, uh, to ask them uh, where that project stands. And they, they gave us a description that that project has been completed. And the concern um, that still remains is there's an ability for the city of Eureka to withhold connection to that project because the county has not yet implemented one of the mitigation measures uh, associated with the, the, that project. And, and the EIR for the Martin Slough Interceptor Project included that, um, that allowance for the city to withhold connections to the um, to the improvements and, um, and the, the city and the county are working together to implement a traffic mitigation program consistent with the requirements of the EIR. And what we've done is to revise the language of one of the or to propose revised language to one of the implementation measures. Um, that describes what the county's going to do to move this, uh, move approval of this project, this traffic mitigation fee forward, and to also identify what happens if somehow things go sideways and, and we're not able to get there. And so we've got some wording up on the screen, and I can maybe make it a little bit bigger. What it says, uh, the title of the of the implementation measure is implement the Martin Slough Interceptor Project and initiate specific actions if the project is canceled. <coughs> and the text reads, the county is in the process of adopting a traffic impact fee in conjunction with the city of Eureka that is consistent with the requirements of the Certified Environmental Impact Report for the MSI or Martin Slough Interceptor Project. If the county and city have not adopted the measure by December 31st of this year, 2019, the Planning and Building Department shall bring forward a program to either amend the project EIR or take other actions to address the requirements of the traffic mitigation measures for consideration by the Board of Supervisors and the City Council. 
if tra the traffic mitigation has not been addressed in a manner that will permit sewer service connection of development of the land inventory at the cities consistent with multifamily housing by December 31st of 2020, next year, the county shall replace the loss of inventory in the area served by the Martin Slough Interceptor on one by one for one basis by rezoning qualified properties in other areas as needed to meet the RHNA RENA for lower income households. Replacement of the lots in the affordable land inventory shall meet all of the criteria of the affordable housing land inventory. Rezoning shall be completed by December 31st 2022 and then we are uh, one of the responsible agencies and of course we're working with the city of Eureka on that. We uh, ran this um, proposed new language um, past Jan Turner who's with the uh, uh, Legal Services of Northern California which brought this forward as a concern at your previous meeting and um, we received a response from her just before the meeting tonight saying that she uh, supports this revised language and has no uh, no further objections to how the Martin Slough project is handled uh, in that in the housing element. Brian. So Michael, I, it seems to me like the 2007 or 2008 housing element going all the way back to there, we've been trying to count on parcels that were gonna be served by the Martin Slough Interceptor Project and thinking that it's just around the corner, we're almost done, we can count these parcels. And now this is the third iteration that we're still not there yet. And I'm just wondering um, that instead of trying to count the parcels even though they don't technically qualify if it wouldn't be more appropriate and straightforward to not count them until they do meet all the legal requirements and take steps as though they weren't available because they weren't available in 2007 they weren't available in 2014 and they weren't available now so it's hard for me as a public servant to say okay we're going to get it right this time when we've been talking about this for for more than a decade. That's just my personal belief. Council? The difference is in previous iterations of the housing element, the Martin Slough interceptor improvements had not been completed. They have been completed. The sewer service is available to serve those parcels. The issue is, are there traffic, are there mitigations for the traffic impacts that might occur as a result of those connections? And there are a number of different <laughs> solutions to that issue. One is the proposed mitigation fee can be adopted and that's on schedule to happen before the end of the year. But if that for some reason doesn't happen, uh, that means there's a mitigation that's identified in an EIR that is not feasible. And so I, th so that analysis has to be done to determine whether or not there is another alternative uh, mitigation measure to address the traffic impacts or that the city and the county m may uh, together decide that it's appropriate to adopt overriding considerations. So there are a number of different potential solutions. Um, and John, I, I think has some other yeah, if comments I could on that. Just maybe simplify this a little bit though, is that uh, we met with uh, Bob Rockwell with uh, uh, Public Works day before yesterday and, and you know, Bob has been working with the city of Eureka. The ordinance for the traffic fee is drafted they are sharing that back and forth with the city of Eureka right now. So this is something that's a partnership. It's very foreseeable. As, as Mr. Ellenwood said, it's not like maybe it was in 2008 where we didn't even have the Martin Sioux Interceptor Project completed yet. That's done. So the, the sewer connection's there. 
It's really now a matter of mitigating the traffic and the city and the county are walking to the same beat to implement the traffic fee. And we've used December 31st not as a, a hopeful date, but as a date that's t kind of doubly out there that if the worst thing happens, it'll still be done well before that. So we, we see that as being imminently foreseeable. Well, I guess just to clarify, it sounded like Michael said that HCSD was withholding our ability to connect until such time as this uh, mitigation measure is implemented. Did I mishear him or misunderstand that? So, no, he, he used correct language, and, and I understand the interpretation of what he said, is that one of the things we wanted to make sure that we didn't run into a problem with is because there is this mitigation requirement that the city of Eureka could technically come to a place where they would not want any more sewer connections issued because of traffic impacts. And, and so they have the ability as the lead agency to stop that. But the reality is right now, we are working with the city of Eureka. The city of Eureka is very much in agreement with the direction that we're going, the language that we're using, and everything else to get this ordinance adopted to do that. So that's really not a um, potentiality that is um, foreseeable right now. We're not concerned that that's going to happen. Is it a legal possibility? Yes. But is, is that what's being done right now with the negotiations and the work that's being done on the ordinance? No. The reality is, is we expect the ordinance to be done well before the end of the year. Let me ask a different series of questions. Where would we be with our housing inventory if we didn't include any of the MSI contingent parcels or if we were to cap that at something that we would estimate as a reasonable number for the city of Eureka to accept until such time as the mitigation measure could be completed? We would still be with able to meet our arena numbers. That's helpful. I, if I were doing it, I would put a cap on what I would submit in my housing inventory until we know that all of these parcels could be permitted because I think that's a more realistic and I think that should have been done in 2008 and 2014. Um, I get that we're almost there, but I don't think we're, we're fully there yet. I have something. Hey. <coughs> I, I'm not familiar with that project, but I, it just sounds like to me that, you know, if you listen to the people in the audience saying we're in a housing crisis and our plan says we're in a housing crisis that our our planning leaders in an, uh, need to work quickly to, to resolve these issues. I mean, I'll, I've been caught in this kind of situation before where you're back and forth, letters, meetings, and there should be more urgency um, to move forward and not like, okay, maybe in another year, another six months, we'll get to, you know, get in a room and figure this out and move forward. Because if every time we have a project, it gets hung up and put off and put off, we're never going to solve the problems that we have in front of us. Uh, kind of a follow-up question to what Peggy brought up. Uh, there's a couple of references in here about uh, projects development by right, and there can be different interpretations by different people. And uh, I would look at it as if it's by right, it might do what Peggy suggested we need, which is to speed up some of these projects. So maybe I could get one of you to to uh, give us what your definition of by right is. <clears throat> so actually, um, the statutes um, will actually further elaborate on what by right means in that context. Um, but what it means is that it's a ministerial in all the cases I have seen where it's referenced in, the, as you saw here, um, the policies is uh, supportive housing, transitional housing, and the buy right for 20% is it's a, a no discretionary permit because um, apparently some jurisdictions um, have a discretionary permit process uh, for um, multifamily housing at a certain threshold. Um, Humboldt County doesn't have that 
that the, that the, that use is what triggers the discretionary permit. Um, I haven't worked for another jurisdiction, so that's a little bit unfamiliar to me. But um, so when it says by right, it's that it's a ministerial permit. Um, you still have to meet the requirements um, to secure a building permit, meet the development standards and whatnot. Director, you have a comment? Yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I was uh, nodding my head in agreement with uh, what Ms. Nelson said. It, it really is straight to building permit. Okay, so then back to Commissioner O'Neill's question or concern about speeding this stuff up. Is this by right? Uh, language going to help speed up the permitting of some of these areas? I, I'll step in. I started this talk. The, the thing that we are committing to do with this is to even facilitate and prioritize issuance of building permits. So we're really trying to take all of the hurdles, all of the block, blockages out of housing development. Um, not only in the planning realm of the permitting process, but the building permit permitting process. And that would be for the level of housing for the low, uh, low income? Particularly for that, yes. Okay. Alan. Well, I wrote down a lot of notes, but I'm only going to bring up four points that I came up with. And this kind of goes to what Brian was saying. Um, we need to come up with some some type of incentives to get the housing going and I mean I'm racking my brain how to get to the low and very low because I think those are going to be in the hundred to hundred and fifty thousand dollar plus per unit to get to the, to get houses into that low so I'm not sure but this county does from time to time do things amazingly and and we need to think outside the box um, I mean we got to think like we did to get cannabis here. I mean, three years ago, we had no cannabis ordinance, and now, I don't know, maybe it's been more than that, it seems like. But uh, that's one that comes to mind. I mean, examples, the road standards, okay? We came up with a whole new set of road standards for cannabis grows out in the hills. We need to come up with something that breaks away from every road's gonna be this width, this design. You go to other communities, they do it. Roads are a huge expense in, in doing developments, I won't go into that, but we got to think outside the box. You know, when the, the county wanted to do a community forest, they didn't have the money, but they figured out a way to do it. So if we want to do this, we got to take and, and look at things like that. We have to think outside the box and go after them. Um, another one, and I don't know how you get around this. I, I'm in the construction industry, but somehow if we're get, I mean, all this housing element surrounds getting grant funding. Let's just be honest. That's what this whole thing is about. It's not really about getting houses on the ground. It's about getting the grant funding to do projects. So when we get that money, we got to figure out how to use it the best we can. And one way, and I know I'm going to catch flack for this one, but is we've got to cut out the government element of it. In, and I'm not county government, but the prevailing wage situation where when you do a, a project that is grant funded, all the, the employees have to be paid at, at those rates. And that sometimes is three times what the standard rate going in that area. So if your cost for doing that labor is two to three times more, how do you get affordable housing? I mean, let's just be honest. We gotta figure out how to break the cycle. I mean, you know, we. We sit here, this thing is pages and pages of stuff that sounds really good, but we got to start thinking outside the box because what we've been doing for the last, I don't know, 60 years hasn't been working. So, um, and my last point, and I brought this one up before, I think we have to be really uh, realistic about these numbers because I didn't one time in here see anything about the whole issue we talked about for meeting after meeting, that was sea level rise, and if we really go down that road and use those overlay maps that we looked at, we're not going to get our low income housing. So those maps wipe out that, that ground. And I can tell you from being in the development industry, the easy projects are gone. The easy land is gone. The ones that are there are too expensive to do. What's left out there is too expensive to develop. So we're going to have to come up with something that hasn't been status quo. Um, and one last question. How come 
before we've even voted on this, we've sent this to HCD. I don't, that doesn't make much sense. It hasn't went to the supervisors yet, but HCD is already looking at this. It seems like that's the cart before the horse, but. Yeah, they require that we send them the draft housing element for review prior to taking action on it. And then they get the, they get the final draft and compare it, I'm assuming? Yeah, okay. that's right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So w with their initial review, I assume what they're looking for is weaknesses where your document may not totally comply with state standards. Is that, is that what they're looking for? That's right. They limit their review to state law. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to ask a question for staff. Are there any ideas or concepts that we looked at from the state, either in the development stage or other communities and jurisdictions that we felt like were too aggressive or too politically charged to consider in this housing element. And the reason I ask is because in the past we were presented with sort of like pathways, like here's the most aggressive path, here's the moderate path, here's the more conservative path. And this way was more, here's what we're presenting as our staff recommendation. But are there things that got left on the the tables inside the planning department that we should be considering. And the reason why I'm asking is because I've heard at the state level they're considering removing the concept of single family residential zoning within certain distances of public transportation. And I'd at least like to have a conversation about that, even if it's only we should study that and bring that back at a later time. Because I think that if we're going to be publicly funding transportation and, and having uh, these things that bring up the value of properties that we should consider higher densities and being more creative with how we put housing in there. So n um, to date, nothing's been left on the table. Um, it's been um, I, what I would describe as an organic process. Um, and I'm sure there are, there is stuff out there that other jurisdictions are doing that we are not um, it haven't incorporated actually um, uh, I think inclusionary actually mandating inclusionary zoning is something that is uh, some jurisdictions do um, but that that isn't so I I am re, re, taking those words back that is not something that is reflected in here uh, is a mandate for inclusionary zoning um, but I ran across um, I think it was actually in a White House briefing paper from 2016 um, for housing to um, for jurisdictions. Uh, some jurisdictions were doing um, property tax abatement for um, for affordable housing projects that, and that maybe uh, it does have some Article 34 implications, but potentially um, there could be a measure that based on the number of units that are the proportional number of units that are restricted would there be some um, comparable uh, offset on the property taxes um, the the housing element does talk about fee referrals it doesn't include fee waivers um, so that is another a further incentive that um, could be considered um, <clears throat> so those those are things that come to mind uh, a couple of others that um, I've heard about is um, jurisdictions are um, are actually paying f or offering uh, f offering financing for developing second units where there's a um, a restriction that for the first ten years um, that unit is rented to a homeless person and there that's a way of um, incentivizing housing production to to address their homeless needs and then the city of Eureka through their zoning code uh, they have um, they've, they've done something that uh, one of the speakers was mentioning which is to allow for um, cottage development on in the single family zones and so the minimum lot size is basically waived for um, in those single family residential zones where there's an alley 
and and you can develop you know just a thousand square foot lots uh, in these five thousand square foot minimum parcel size zones, and, and so those are some of the ideas that we felt were just too heavy of a lift for us to bring forward at this time. Mike. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I have a couple of questions um, regarding the letter from Jan Turner from Legal Services. And um, one of them was, was about uh, prior sites or sites relied upon in prior housing elements. If an extra column could be added in there, um, if we're going to use them still, maybe we can point them out that they've been around forever um, to just make amends about that for in the future. Um, the other thing that um, I see uh, from her uh, recommendation, and I agree with, is the incentives uh, um, should be reserved for affordable housing. Um, financial incentives uh, could be tied to price controls, as she says here, an assurance that housing is produced with incentives to be affordable. Um, I think um, I agree with her that we should reserve the financial incentives for affordable housing. Um, since we've met numbers on other types of housing in the past. Um, what about the rest of the things that she pointed out in her um, in legal services letter here? Most of it um, on the money or what? Well, certainly uh, I, I don't want to um, take away from the important points that she's raising. Uh, there is, we do have some disagreement about some of the, um, the, the specific items she's bringing up. Like for instance, there's some of these parts. Certain sites land, and stuff, yes. Yeah, the land inventory. Okay. That's been, um, the, the sites that we're bringing forward in the affordable land inventory are generally those that were in the previous housing element and she's contesting the validity of those sites those sites um, because they were accepted by HCS or by HCD um, last time and and we've had a conversation with HCD and they they intend to um, support our inclusion of them uh, in this land inventory as well. And so uh, I disagree with with her uh, characterization on those yeah. parcels. Well, that that's fine. Um, I think just if we break out another column and just have that in there, that would be fine then. Yeah, and that's something that HCD uh, asked for as well. Ah, okay. Um, there was, um, Commissioner Bongio mentioned we have to think outside the box, and I certainly agree that we have to do that. I'm not for tent cities, but I would like to see um, possibly more inclusion in the, um, the SROs uh, with uh, the single bedroom, with uh, community uh, bathrooms, showers, and kitchen. Um, maybe that can be encouraged. Um, and along the idea of tiny houses, possibly with uh, limited um, start, just to see how that would work. Um, but we do have to think outside the box in order to get affordable housing to people uh, to get them off the streets. Thanks. Thank you. Well, we've had uh, a, uh, one of the uh, things that I've heard come through public testimony, not only really tonight, but uh, on uh, the uh, one of the previous meetings that we had on public comment was that uh, seems to be a concentration of the par land parcels available. It seemed to be heavily concentrated in the McKinleyville area and the greater Eureka area. Um, and tonight, I think we had three or four, I didn't want really to keep track of uh, the folks from Southern Humboldt and uh, bring up that there certainly is a, a definite need to to not forget Southern Humboldt. Uh, if, if the lady's numbers were right, she said, uh, I think nearly 10% of their, their population was homeless. Uh, and Southern Humboldt 
you know, doesn't really have the infrastructure, which is why the available land inventory isn't down there, isn't as, as more down there, put it this way. Uh, and so, you know, it, it's also the heart of where the trimigant problem is, which is where a lot of our homeless, uh, low-income folks uh, come into our communities. And so, you know, I think that that um, with the one policy or goal that we had having to do with uh, looking at um, unique uh, construction items, uh, I think if we, um, if I'd like to see some language in there that basically um, would would allow for uh, composting toilets, because I think composting toilets tied with tiny houses uh, might be a mechanism or some of the rural areas which uh, are having this problem uh, can be alleviated and it would take some of the pressure off of our larger communities as compared to trying to you know cram all of our low income affordable into into uh, McKinleyville or, or the greater Eureka so uh, I think that uh, there's certainly provision in the the, the policy that I saw but I, I somewhere in either the implementation of the standards, I, like, I, I think we should address that issue so that some of this, uh, uh, some of our problems can be solved by going into the area, the rural areas where, where a lot of the stuff is at. And it's probably really hard to identify. I wouldn't surprise me if Southern Humboldt isn't higher than, than what they found on their, on their uh, point in time count uh, because it's such, it's such a massive area. Uh, where it's much easier to come to McKinleyville, or Eureka, or Donald Waterfront and do your count. It's really hard to do it when you've got uh, uh, several hundred square miles you might have to do down in Southern Humboldt. Uh, so I, I think if that was, if there was a little bit more language in there to address that, it would, it would really make my comfort uh, level come up. But all in all, I think this is a fairly good packet for the long term. Uh, it's, it's not ideal. Uh, but I don't think you're ever going to get an I ideal packet, but I think this certainly is, you know, it probably is sufficient uh, to give guidance to uh, the staff and the other departments, the DHSS, that uh, are going to have to uh, communicate back and forth and, and uh, uh, press this along. So, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I would be in favor, I think, of, of moving this, this item along. So, Brian, you had a comment? I did. Um I noticed that the planning period for this housing element seemed to be a bit longer than previously. And I also heard some what I thought were fairly good ideas that you said uh, might take too long for you to have gotten them for us for this update. And so I guess what I'm asking is, since this is an eight year planning horizon, could we add an additional step that in three to four years, we look at how we're doing with respect to our goals, and if we're not on track with our low income and very low income households, that we uh, update and add some of these more aggressive policies uh, and relook at that. Is that is that something the H HCD would permit? I guess. Yeah, that would be a voluntary revisiting of our housing element, and they would, uh, I would think only assert jurisdiction when we come forward with uh, revisions to the housing element. Would staff be amenable to that if I were to uh, include that as a requested modification? A absolutely, that would be um, acceptable. We just want to also point out that we're also obligated to give an annual report. And the annual report is something that the Planning Commission could look at and, and give guidance on each year. Um, and so you may want to take that into account as you think about your motion. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, most of my concerns with the actual goals and objectives have um, been satisfied. I was very happy to see a lot of them incorporated in there and overall looks really good. Um, so my concerns are really with the process and the projected outcomes. I've already spoken as to what my concerns are in terms of unknowns. Um, in terms of the process, obviously in an ideal world, uh, 
you know, this all would have been started before this would have gone to the ballot already in anticipation of the housing element. I mean, we know these things are coming up. Uh, so, you know, I understand life can be very taking and so not everything can be anticipated, but just the next time around, you know, it's, it's, it's good to start these things early so that we, we eliminate a lot of the unknowns. So we would have already had something on the ballot. We'd have that as a known uh, coordination with HCD, Department of Health and Human Services, all of these things. Uh, it, would, it would really be a lot better if we had all of this done already in advance. Um, obviously, the slew restoration is beyond uh, control since that was just recently completed. Um, that we do have an August 30th deadline. So that is, in case anyone's wondering why <laughs> we can't just keep putting this off uh, and why it would have been perhaps great to have some of this done years in advance. But as we all know, that often doesn't happen. So um, my other concerns have to do with the projected outcomes, as I've already spoken of. Um, and tied to that is... Uh, well, in relation to the unknowns, of course, there's my, there are CEQA concerns. So uh, I was glad that Commissioner Mitchell brought that up earlier because because it is one of the things I wanted to bring up. So when you do have any kind of reliance on, for example, an EIR, you are usually looking at an addendum, which is uh, defined by the CEQA as minor technical additions or adjustments. Uh, you could also be looking at a supplemental, which is, as it implies, just a supplement, and it's for minor changes, and that uh, the requirement for that is you just have to circulate the supplemental. And then you could also have a subsequent EIR, and that's where there are more major changes, and then you would have to recirculate and renotice the entire EIR. And uh, conditions for that would be, for example, major changes, um, a new effect we've seen that there could potentially be new effects associated with some of the changes that are in there. Um, there's probably fair argument to be made for it. Uh, just the garbage alone. I mean, if we don't have the assurances that the garbage is going to be taken care of, uh, we all know that there's huge effects in terms of the environment. That's a, an anticipated, clearly anticipated environmental adverse effect. Uh, there's been a lot of studies on this with the Roma in Europe, and typically, you know, the, the water resources are the most affected. So I do believe that there's a fair argument that could be made that this should really have gone to, um, according to 15162, you can look it up, the section, uh, to a subsequent EIR, uh, just based on the, chain, the, the changes. There's also other... I, I won't go into all of it, but you know, it could also be that the one of the mitigations or the alternatives in the previous was previously infeasible, but now it is feasible, and um, th it would reduce the adverse effects. And you know, that that's also possible <laughs> from my look at it. Now, I, it's my professional sequa opinion that it probably should be a supplemental. This is for minor changes. You only have to recirculate the supplemental. I do think that there are anticipated, there's a fair argument to be made that the anticipated effects are going to be such that probably we shouldn't have done this as an addendum. That's main, mainly for technical minor adjustments. Um, I just wanted to say that for the record, not necessarily because I would like to have the commission you know, look at that and have the planning department uh, put that out there. But I, I would like that to say that for the record, that it is my professional opinion that it probably should be a, a supplemental rather than um, just an addendum. Uh, and like I said, I'm, I'm very happy to see a lot of the actual goals and objectives in there. Thank you. Brian. Mr. Chairman, I would like to take this time just to thank the many members of the community that have come out and taken their time to comment on this and for the many, many staff hours that have gone into looking at this and trying to address the issues of housing affordability in this county because I really do think it is a crisis and has been 
um, for some time, but I think that the main thing that we can do tonight to help with this is to move this forward so that we are eligible to receive monies that can help build affordable housing projects. And with that, um, I would like to make a motion that we adopt the resolution in attachment one recommended that the Humboldt County Board of Supervisors consider the addendum to the general plan EIR, find that no new information has been presented that changes the finding of the PEIR pursuant to section 15162 of the state CEQA guidelines, consider the findings from the State Department of Housing and Community Development, and adopt the Planning Commission recommendation 2019 amendments to the housing element based on the evidence in the staff report and public testimony, and I'd like to add to this that every year uh, the we should have an agendized item to review how we're doing and that at the halfway mark that if we are not on track that staff revisit some of these more controversial um, and more heavy lifting ideas and bring that back to our commission so we can discuss and debate whether or not we need to do more to help those who uh, are are least fortunate among us. And I would second that, Brian. We have a motion and a second. Is everyone clear on the motion? Any questions on the motion? I have one question. There was some comments and suggestions tonight. I wonder if we can incorporate them more into Any question on the motion? All, all in favor? I, Go ahead. I, I just had some questions about it, exactly what, <clears throat> which of the um, changes that you wanted to be uh, wanted to make to it. Could we run those last year? <clears throat> so what I understood, what I heard, and please correct me if I was missed the missed your comments, um, was to promote safe housing within existing housing units. Was was one of the points um, to provide restriction that the uh, I think another um, member of the Commission echoed this um, that the um, incentives for um, affordable housing be reserved for or the incentives be reserved for affordable housing um, and then to support um, our federal um, and uh, recognized tribes in their housing authorities and their efforts to develop housing within their territories or if they own land outside of their territory. Um, and if I may amend that too, I think we have uh, a few tribes that are maybe just state recognized and don't have a federal recognition. That's that's what I heard if... if uh, it was to make sure that they're included and named in the plan so that they can go back and use that to go after their own funding because they have to be in a plan to get funding also. Okay, thank you for that clarification. And then one other clarification I wanted to make is um, this language, this new language for HIM 7 acceptable to the commission. I, ble I believe yes. so. Thank you. I think also <coughs> you know, to, to add to Brian's comments that when you come back and review, we should look at what those impediments are from the community housing um, groups and those in the community that are trying to provide affordable housing but are meeting with obstacles like you know, um, high costs for mitigation or infrastructure that's preventing low-income low housing to be built. I'd like to know what those were, what they are. And if there are individuals that are getting in the way that, or policies that we take a look at those. Okay, we have a motion before us. All in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. The uh, motion is passed, and that should be moved along to the uh, to the board. And we have two other items left on our agenda. Uh, one of them, I believe, is a continuation. That should be a very quick item. Yes, we would ask that you would continue that to the August 1st meeting. We are not scheduling anything for the July 25th meeting, and we're gonna concentrate everything on August 1st so that we don't have a meeting with two or three items on it. Okay. Is there anyone in the audience uh, that, uh, on the Tony Alina Parcel Map Subdivision McKinnonville who cannot make it to the uh, 
July what, what, 25th? August. August 1st. August 1st meeting uh, uh, on this item and, and would like to speak tonight. Is there anyone? 